get excited. I'm here with Dean DeBlois, the director of How to Train Your Dragon 2. <laughs> You've all seen the teaser. This thing went like crazy viral when it went out. Uh, yeah, actually. yeah. It wasn't entirely intentional at first, but then <laughs> we got so excited about it that we posted it officially. Oh, so that wasn't meant to be a teaser? No, at first it was a leak. <gasps> yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. So you were just like, let's embrace it, right? <laughs> yes, yes. Well, I loved the flying sequences in the first film, and mm -hmm. you were the co-director in that with Chris. Yes. Right? You both worked at Disney, uh, and, and then you came over with him, and you said you went to do some live action stuff? I did, yeah. I did. I set up a couple projects to write and direct. Those are still percolating out there. And then I got a call from Chris saying, what are you doing right now? Because he had been assigned to How to Train Your Dragon with... 14 months left before its release. Oh it's not goodness. a lot of time in the world of animation. Well, you guys pulled it off. Thank you. So what, how did you get the, why are you flying solo? Uh, because Chris got involved with Crudes, and now Crudes 2. <laughs> and wow. at the time, he was deep into Crudes. Jeffrey Katzenberg asked me if I would be interested in doing a sequel, and I said, if you were interested in doing a trilogy, because that means we can do the middle of the story, and we can so have a very finite end. So you're mythology. Yes. This is, oh, that's great. <laughs> wow, this is fantastic. Okay, so, uh, so let's, let me, I, I, oh, you got me so excited with that, I forgot the question <laughs> I wanted to ask you. I was like, a trilogy? That's exciting. So you're really going to build, build up this mythology? Yes. Oh, okay, perfect. Oh, yes, I don't know what to ask you. It was a wild ride you guys had at the box office the first time around. It was, yeah. it was. It was actually the first weekend was a little disappointing because they were hoping for higher the, numbers. I remember the Wall Street headlines. Yep. Yeah. And scary. then, strangely, uh, it fell off very little. And for the next five weeks, it continued to hold yeah. up, up at the top of the box office. It actually came back to be number one five weeks out Which from the release. Which rarely happens these days, mm -hmm. right? Okay, so, all right. So everybody's talking about the fact that you decided to age up the characters. Yes, that was that was part of the grand plan, that uh, this, play, this movie would take place five years later. Because the, the idea is that we're going to map Hiccup's coming of age. Oh, wow. And he had a very sort of pubescent problem in the first oh, movie. Oh, yeah, definitely. And we also solved that problem. Like, he was pining for the girl. He wanted his father's affection. He wanted the town's love. He got all of those things. And he got a super cool dragon. So that I think... often helps. He, in any sequel, it it's then becomes a task. How do you take a character whose problem you fixed and then break him again so he has something more? And we thought he, what he really needs to ultimately learn is the responsibility and the importance of the idea of ascending to become chief at one day. One day, so wow. it, can, it charts his uh, his growth well, as speaking, a young adult. Speaking of chief and his dad, okay, his dad was very worried about him. Yes. How he turned out, but you know he looks kind of badass in this teaser <laughs> with you know all the spikes and everything. Yeah. Is he becoming his father's son? In a strange way, yes, because he has all of the leadership qualities of his father, but I think Hiccup's big problem as we begin the, the movie is he doesn't want to be a carbon copy of anyone. He's still trying to figure out who he is to become. And his father's pressuring him to, you know, stay home, kind of hang up hang up the, uh, the reins and take over the mantle of chief, which is something that's kind of worrying to Hiccup. So it's, it's part of his problem in the beginning, but ultimately I think Hiccup does have those qualities. It's just he's much more tenacious and curious than his father is and willing to sort of fly out there and to, dangerous way to try to try to mitigate and create peace. Wow. And you know, also in the teaser, you very prominently displayed his prosthetic. Yes. Which I thought was a very bold choice in the first film. I really like that. Thank uh, you. And so I'm curious, is that going to be something that just, you know, it's not really touched upon in the second film because he's just going to be like everyone, you know, you're going to, you know, you could go two ways with it. The message of it doesn't define him or you could really grapple with it. Which way are you going to go? I think it's because it's five years later. He's just learned to adapt to it, so it's uh, it's something that doesn't hold him back. And I think that was the intent. Was even though he's he's suffered a rather uh, impressive loss at the end of the first movie, that it doesn't make him any less of a hero. And now it's just something that's part of him. He's actually used it to his advantage because his prosthetic leg has been traded out for kind of like the Swiss Army knife of of ah. prosthetics. He's got retractable feet that can fit every sort of He's occasion. He's tricked himself <laughs> out. I love the, uh, the glider wings that he had, yes. right? I yeah, mean, the idea that they, they keep pushing the boundaries of trust and, and, and dynamic flight. He's learning about aerodynamics. He's, he's constructed for himself the equivalent of bike leather uh, oh. just, to, just to sort of keep himself warm and, and deal with the wind resistance. And it's all very nerdy in a way. Like, it, he's kind of cool, it. but I think his girlfriend Astrid is always one to point out that, you know, the, Kind of, there's, there's an element of the of the ridiculous to his outfit as well. <laughs> but he's flying. Yes. So it all paid off. Yes. So we have we have Hiccup, we have Astro, we have Toothless. Can you tell me some of the new characters we're going to meet? 
I can indeed. In fact, we made some cast announcements, announcements today. I saw, you made some yes. headlines. Yes, so uh, joining our cast are Kate Blanchett, one of my favorite actresses in the world. Uh, she plays a character named Valka, who is kind of a recluse uh, vigilante in a way. She's been saving dragons from traps for the better part of you know a decade or two. And she's amassed uh, a colony of thousands of rescued dragons. So she's kind of like an SPCA member. She's just out there for looking after the animals. Ladies. Yes. <laughs> well, there's a little bit of that too. I mean, she's had so much, uh, so much dragon contact and very little human contact oh, that, that she's great. she's kind of like Diane Fossey. She's very Ooh. much immersed and she has a lot of oh, their that's traits. that's really fascinating. Okay, that's great. All right, so how and about Kit Harrington? Kit Harrington uh, plays the, the self-declared greatest trapper, dragon trapper of all. He actually, for a living, traps dragons and sells them to the third cast member, Jaiman Hunzu, who plays Drago Bloodvist. That's your big villain. He's right? the big villain. Okay. We introduce him in this movie, and he is he's sort of a maniacal conqueror. Stoic knows about him from an altercation years and years ago. He's a stranger from a strange land, but he has a very driven purpose, which is to uh, dominate. He wants to conquer the world, and he thinks his way to do that is to enslave all of the world's dragons and have a fire-breathing army that no one could resist. Oh, so yeah. Kit Harrington's character is, is fueling that by constantly capturing dragons, and Kate Blanchett's character is, is kind of subverting that by, them free. by freeing them. And so there's a, this dynamic, the exactly, he flies in just wanting to create peace and he just realizes he's dealing with something that's much bigger than himself. Wow, that sounds great. Last question. New characters, sure. Any new dragons? Absolutely, of course. We couldn't make a new, a new How to Train Your Dragon sequel without new dragons. There are some super cool ones, actually. Some of my favorite designs have, have been turned into characters now. Uh, Stoic is going to have his own dragon, Gobber has his own dragon. The uh, Valka, the Kate Blanchett yeah. character, her dragon is amazing. Are and, they going to uh, be more cute? Like the because you went two ways in the first one. You had cute, and then you had that giant island of a dragon. I think it's both. Yeah. Okay. I great. think it's both, and we also set up the idea that the understanding that there is a, a queen to every nest in the first movie, we take that a step further to reveal that there is a king of all dragons. There is an alpha, oh. and uh, they all in the in the hierarchy of dragons, there is one even above. <gasps> the villain dragon of the last movie. That sounds like a third movie kind of character right there, yes. right? Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. He definitely <laughs> plays into the second as well. Oh, really? That's yeah. exciting. All right, so you got to see two if you want to get three. <laughs> All right? Yeah, Thank don't you. don't miss the middle of the story. <laughs>